This video is sponsored by Brilliant. When I visited New York for the first time in December 2017, I was lucky enough to see the city in the snow. Well, I say lucky. After 30 minutes of magic, seeing the Christmas trees and the skyscrapers in the snow, I realised that I was actually incredibly wet and cold, and can it please go back to normal now, please? But also, it's not all of that lucky to see the city in the snow. A statistic I was subsequently told was that New York gets more snow than the South Pole. But how on earth could this be true? The South Pole is one of the coldest places on Earth. It's the point in the middle of Antarctica, famously full of snow. And New York? Well, New York looks like this in the summer. So I downloaded some data and took a look. Unfortunately, data on the exact South Pole is hard to come by, partly thanks to extreme isolation and partly thanks to the US government shutdown currently locking me out of NOAA datasets. Thanks, Captain Smallhands. So I had to find a comparable statistic for New York to this set from the German Meteorological Office's records of the South Pole Research Station. Here, the measurement is average millimetres of precipitation per month. I couldn't compare this to precipitation from New York, as that would also include sleet, hail, and rain, while the South Pole's precipitation is, to all intents and purposes, exclusively snow. So I downloaded data of snow depth from the ECMWF the units of which are millimetres of water equivalent, or the depth of water you'd get if you melted all the snow. The time series of New York snow depth from 1979 looks like this, with clear spikes every year in the winter. To approximate the snowfall each day, I looked at the difference between subsequent measurements. If the difference between snow depth on two days was positive, then there was snowfall on that day. If the difference was negative, then there was snow melt. To get the total snowfall in a given month, then I simply summed up all the differences between days whenever that difference was positive. I will be the first to admit that this is a pretty janky approximation, even with six hourly resolution, but the best I could do with what was available. But whilst it is an approximation, importantly, this method produced a dataset which, as far as I can tell, produced data with the same units as the measurements taken at the South Pole. If you plot the snowfall precipitation from the South Pole and compare it to the estimated data from New York, there's no contest. New York, by my method, gets 177.3 millimetres of water equivalent in snow precipitation on average each year. The South Pole gets 2.1 millimetres. So how? To get snow falling on the ground, you need two things. You need moisture in the air and you need freezing temperatures in the atmosphere from the layer that the snow forms at down to the ground. The South Pole absolutely has that last point covered, with the warmest average monthly temperatures being about minus 25 degrees Celsius. Every day is cold enough for snow. This is possible because the South Pole receives the least energy from the sun of any point on the Earth's surface, apart from the North Pole, is very reflective, meaning it doesn't absorb much energy from the sun, and is in the middle of a giant continent. Areas in the middle of continents have a much greater difference in temperature between summer and winter than areas near the ocean. This is because water has a much higher heat capacity per square metre than land, meaning that it takes much more energy to change the temperature of the ocean compared to land. You can see this both on a seasonal scale, with oceans barely feeling the effects of the seasons while continental areas roast in summer and freeze in winter, but also on a daily scale. This animation shows the surface temperature of the Earth over a few weeks. You can see the effect of the sun heating the land during during the day, which then cools at night, while the ocean stays a nearly constant temperature. This provides a moderating influence on the land near the ocean. It cools the land in summer and warms it in winter. However, the South Pole's distance from the ocean, whilst guaranteeing frozen temperatures year-round, also prevents it from meeting the other criteria necessary for snow – moisture in the air. If we switch variables in this animation from surface temperature to total precipitable water in the air, we see that Antarctica is incredibly dry. A strong zonal circulation prevents moisture from further north reaching the continent, and almost all the water on Antarctica is frozen and locked in. Even on the rare occasions that moisture does reach the interior, there's another problem. While water can freeze and form snow crystals on its own, it's much easier if there's a source of nucleating centres, things that water can freeze on. These include biological sources, black carbon like soot, and plain old dust. There are very few sources of nucleation centres at the South Pole, meaning that even when moisture does reach that far south, it finds it incredibly difficult to actually form snow crystals. These difficulties are so great that in terms of precipitation, Antarctica is actually a desert, the largest desert on Earth. By contrast, New York is right on the coast, and so has a warmer climate, but still experiences extremely cold days. Check one. More importantly, New York has ready sources of moisture, the Atlantic Ocean, but also the Great Lakes. 
The Great Lakes lie to the west of New York, and the prevailing wind in New York comes from the west, meaning that the lakes provide a great deal of moisture that, when the conditions are right in winter, can form snow. So yes, New York does receive more snow than the South Pole, but then that's not all of that impressive. London receives more snow than the South Pole. The end of the Earth may be very cold, but it's also very dry, thanks to meteorological isolation and being so far from the ocean. The wind may move snow around on Antarctica and bring it to the South Pole, but it's very rare to see new snowflakes falling there. If you enjoyed these animations of geophysical data, then you might want to check out Planet Snaps on Twitter, a bot I coded which automatically generates visualizations of the Earth every couple of hours. I'd never done any coding based on web interactions before, so this project was a real learning experience. Picking a project and learning how to do things along the way has always been the best way to learn a skill like coding, in my experience, which is why I'm super happy to say that this video was sponsored by Brilliant. Brilliant is an educational website that emphasizes learning through solving problems, presenting you with new theory before testing your knowledge. As with my case learning to code my bot, it's absolutely okay to get stuff wrong. As long as you learn from your mistakes and don't get disheartened, you'll get there in the end. Something that Brilliant reminds you. Brilliant has a series of courses perfect for those wishing to learn how to program, including a course on Python, the language I used, coming soon. I'd recommend doing what I did on my bot, learning a little bit each day and consistently pushing yourself to solve new problems. To do so, go to brilliant.org slash Simon Clark, and the first 200 of you to do so will get 20% off the annual subscription to view all their excellent courses. Thank you for watching the video. If you found the science in this one interesting, then definitely check out the crash course that I made with Dr. Tom Dowling, who helped advise me on the script for this episode, all about the science of the cryosphere. Don't forget to check out Planet Snaps on Twitter, and thank you very much for watching. I'll see you in the next one.